I had a good read on the Knicks game, but Jalen Brunson's injury kind of disrupted my flow of everything, and the halftime hedge wasn't so much a hedge. All right, we turn the page. Two more playoff games in the association. I love one of the favorites, and I absolutely love a prop bet in one of those games. And is it too early to discuss finals MVP odds? We'll look into that. Arthur's got a pick as well. Newer's in the house. Come join us. It is playoff basketball. We're in the thick of it. And just when I'm thinking two heavy hitters are about to go at it, Doug, we got four series, 2-0, and 2-0, and another 1-0, and and now we're here with Mavs at Thunder. Are we going to get a competitive series, or is this going to be a lopsided thing? I hate when series go lopsided, and I really thought this was going to be a big one with Kyrie, with Luka on the other side, but let's break it down a little bit more. Mavs at Thunder. Thunder laying five here. Uh, first game, absolute blowout. None of us kind of expected that, but we know Luka has issues. Kyrie here and there. What are we thinking? I'm thinking the Thunder are that much better. I really am. Um, I was not sure, but this team is sort of getting dismissed. I think it starts when everyone was saying, oh, the Lakers should have tanked to avoid Denver in the first round to face OKC. Well, that's only because OKC doesn't match up well with the Lakers and then the Lakers dominated the regular season but meetings. But that doesn't mean like OKC is bad and they're very young. But what the Thunder have done, they've just been smacking teams and really impressive. I mean, they do have the coach of the year. They have the runner up in the MVP. And they're so deep. And a guy like Jalen Williams, people are realizing he's so much better than just a role player. So I was hoping there'd be a little line value on the favorite like the market would expect to bounce back. So if game one was three and a half, four, I was hoping it would stay four. But, you know, odds makers in the market saw what I saw. Thunder looked really, really impressive. I mean, you're talking about a team that can just rip off points. They dropped a buck 17 in game one. But they're third in offensive efficiency. They push pace. SGA, the guy who's the head of the snake and the orchestrator, the maestro, he makes all the right passes, and they were bombing from threes. And when they're making threes, which is not that out of the norm, they're just really tough to beat. And I don't really care if Kyrie and Luka combine for 60-65. You still got to double that to beat this team. And they're just so potent, and that second unit is lethal. So I think the Mavs are in a world of hurt right now. Fair enough. Now you're talking about Kyrie and Luka, obviously, combining for 60-65. Let's talk about Talk about little props here. Now, I feel like Luca really hasn't been 100% this whole time. He's obviously always nursing some type of injury. However, my man's props are still at 30 and a half. How am I supposed to approach this knowing, uh, you know, this guy's always physically banged up? But that that line is out of his world. Yeah, yeah. It's, for me, it's under or pass. But I'm not stepping up and firing on the under because he's played a little possum at times. And I'm not saying he's faking or anything. Right. I guess the better way to say it, he's demonstrated in the past an ability to play through pain and injury and put up ridiculous numbers. His volume was there. Six of 19 shooting, one of eight from downtown. So he had 19 in game one. And to get 12 more points isn't a ton to ask, especially because Jason Kidd pulled the starters with about four minutes to go. They punt it. So you get to add a couple more minutes of game time. Maybe they play better. So I'm not ready to totally count it out, but there's no chance, given that knee injury, I would bet over. No chance. Because... I think Luca, if I mean to be honest, like he can't go, he he needs to get everyone involved. Like Hardaway needs to shoot better, um, Green needs to shoot better, PJ Washington needs to score more. All these guys, because like I was kind of joking a second ago, even if he and Kyrie combine for sixty five, they can get run out of gym. So he's got to be a facilitator and sort sort of more LeBron than Curry, you know. And he and LeBron was his comps, like the triple double waiting to happen, and he was ripping off thirty point triple doubles during the regular season. But I think he's going to be really need to get everyone involved. But OKC's tough, man. And then you put Lou Dort, who's awesome defender, when he gets involved and Casey Wallace plays well. And there's just the incredible length of the Thunder. That's what really disrupts opposing teams because, you know, you run out to the shooter and guys had to get it over him. And I think the Thunder, I think the Thunder are the right side here. I'm going to agree with you right there. I think I thought of the real deal. They got a chance to take this whole thing home. Check it out. That right there, the marquee matchup. Doug, let's break down some Eastern Conference semifinal action here. Uh, Cavs at Celtics. A very interesting storyline here. Cavs obviously had to go that full Game 7 stretch. Didn't have much rest. Turn around. Face the Celtics. Doesn't work out so well. We're thinking, okay, all right, you know, maybe a fluke. Let's go to Game 2. And then this line comes out, and it is absolutely disrespectful. Uh, 
the Cavs at Celtics. Celtics wing 13 and a half on this one, Doug. Over under is 213. Don't oh, no, even worry about that. It's very rare that we say primetime play in a double digit uh, spread here. Do we think the Cavs can rebound or is this going one way now? So there's certainly a concern just over all these years, uh, all the scar tissue, I like to say, like, don't bet what you last saw. We talk about it all the time, you know, recency bias, right? The Celtics aren't beginning game two with like a 15 point lead. So to see the line go from 11 and a half to 13 and a half, I think it's really just a reaction to maybe this poor missing Porzingis is not that big of a deal because uh, Cleveland's so limited. Um, when Donovan Mitchell gets going and he got going and was buckets and everything, they're good. They're not great, but they're good. But he plays a little too much hero ball and everyone else can't compete with the Celtics. Ultimately, it's going to come down to three-point shots. Let's look at game one shooting numbers. Uh, Celtics, the delta at the three-point line was seven more made threes. That's a 21-point advantage from the behind the arc, and that's ultimately roughly what the, the margin was, 25. So comes down, you know, they say this all the time, it's a make-or-miss league. It really is. The only game the Celtics lost in the first round was against Miami when game two, when Miami bombed 23 made threes, over 50% from downtown. So, like, what can you do? Celtics didn't even play that badly. It's just the Heat, even without Butler, hit everything. So, if the Cavs are going to hit everything, fine. But the Celtics, with this analytics and three-point shooting, and they're they're more likely to make threes than their opponents. And, yes, Porzingis is a reason for that, but all these other guys. So, it's all that, you know, we all see those shot charts where it's all the red dots around the perimeter and then everything around the bucket. That's what Boston does with a couple Jalen Brown, like mid-range free throw line jumpers. That's it. And Boston will just beat you at this game because they have better shooters and no holes. They'll go five out with Horford, usually with Porzingis, but they'll do Horford. And then even their bench is better. And then guys like Derek White are emerging as legit players, not just complimentary players. Derek White could be a a legit player. So uh, unless Cleveland gets its act together and Jared Allen is still questionable, he's got the rib issue, and they're not the same defensively without him, I'm not ready to lay the 13 up. I, to your point about the quick turnaround from game seven, I think that really hurt Cleveland. There's a part of me that thinks they can keep this inside the number. So not a great like sort of angle, but this Cavs team, I think, is definitely not on the same level. So I'm still on all my series props of minus two and a half games, things like that. I'm going to sweat those out. Fair enough. Let's talk about a team that's on the next level. That'll be the Celtics. Let's talk about this first half uh against the spread during the season. These guys are 61, 26, and 1. That is a ridiculous 70% against the spread. First half, is there money to be made here? Clearly, throughout the entire season, there is. So this is sort of inside in the weeds of betting. And the Celtics have demonstrated they're so much better than every other team. And really, that is demonstrated with this first half cover percentage. By far the best in the league, 70% ATS. Because what happens is they had a lot of double-digit spreads this year, and it's obviously applicable here in Game 2. When you get into that 13 to 14 and a half, 15, all those lines, it ends up being garbage time. Anyone who sweat out the end of some of those Miami games in Round 1 saw the Heat kind of backdoor covered a couple second-half lines and things like that. And that's because the starters are out. So there's so much more line value on the first-half line because you know you're getting max effort and the full Boston starters and, and main reserves. Whereas at the end of the game, it's garbage time, as Marv Albert would say. So you have no line value. It's kind of like when Alabama plays the fourth quarter of those 28-point spreads. They pull the starters and things like that. So that's why they're so dumb in the first half. They're gangbusters in the first half. Now, there should be a higher tax. uh, tax. So if I were to make this line, I would tax the first half. I'd make it like nine in the first half. So not just a little more than half of the 13 and a half. I'd make it a lot more because of the... 13 and a half factors in garbage time. I lean that way, but I think we're going to see a strong Cavs effort. The one pushback I have on this first half trend and all that stuff is anytime you want a truer outcome of something, you want the larger sample size. So if you're going to flip a coin and you want 50% heads and tails, you're going to take the 100 flips of the coin versus six, right? Because you might get skewed 4-2 or something like that. And if the you know peak Golden State Warriors are going to play the worst team in the league, that worst team in the league is going to be like, all right, first team to score wins. <laughs> but the Warriors will be like, no, first to 100 wins because they want 
uh, you know, the more the truer outcome, the more volume. So if you believe in the Celtics and you think that that much better than Cleveland, you want four quarters as opposed to two. Right. So that's I mean, now granted the point spread is going to be different and adjust, but. Uh, the first half in game one was a little tight. It lined at 10, could have gone either way. So this is by no means a foolproof thing, but it's hard to argue with 70%. I love it. Now, if you want to sweat double digits, uh, double digit spreads middle of the week like we do, uh, check out our app. It's on the App Store, only players app. Everything's broken down. And like we said, first half, second half bets, we have in-game notifications, something you really should take advantage of. Download it wherever you get your apps from the App Store today. If you're looking a way to get some anxiety, well, boy, do I have a way for you. It's Doug's Give Props Time. Doug, uh, we're talking about props here. We're talking about prop betting, and Doug wants to give you some free anxiety. Let's get into it. Ah, this kills me. You have been doing this throughout the series. Uh, Evan Mobley, my man's three-pointers. The over-under is .5. It's just one. My man is on this court for over half an hour every single game. And you're sitting there sweating that he does not make a three. However, this has been working for you. It's not open gym where he's sitting in the corner shooting. But he's out there 35 minutes a game. Okay, there is an angle to this. And I'm not just trying to generate sponsorships for heart medicine or anything like that. We are trying to make money here. Okay, here's the angle. And it makes a lot of sense. And odds makers, I'm not going to say they're asleep at the wheel, but there's still an edge. And the market has moved the last few games. So what happens, what's going on, anyone who's followed this team in the playoffs, is Jared Allen's missed the last few games. Jared Allen is their starting center. Evan Mobley is their starting four. All season, Mobley's good for about a half to make a three or one three every couple games. When he's the stretch four and he, and he hangs out on offense a lot behind the three-point line. Well, what happens is Allen has missed the last few games, so they don't just replace him with another starting center. They move Mobley to the five and start another forward, and Mobley plays center on offense. And that means he plays around the rim. So the last few games, he hasn't even attempted a three-point shot. Now, a couple times, I think habits die, you know, don't die slowly. So there's been times on offense where he lingers to the short corner three, and he's been open. I'm not saying a lot, like two or three times a game, and no one looks at him. Mitchell doesn't give it to him. Mitchell shoots a floater in in the paint. So there is a chance he will get the ball and shoot a three-pointer. He's not that good of a three-point shooter. So it's not like he's automatic or anything. And he's unlikely to attempt one. So even at minus 220 range, it's still value. Because what that means, $2, 220 range is like 68%. There is a much higher likelihood of 68% than that he does not even attempt a three, let alone make one. I think there's about a 90% chance he does not make a three if Jared Allen does not play because he has to start at the five. And then we have to wait and we send out the alerts the last couple of games. We have to get confirmation like, you know, he's at shoot around. You know, you have to sweat it out all day. But about an hour before tip off, 45 minutes before tip off, there'll be confirmation whether Jared Allen is in or not. If Allen is out, then you can release the hounds. Again, I think it's 90%. We've made some good units on it. But if Jared Allen's in, see, the funny thing is the odds makers adjust all of Mobley's props up for for usage. So mm. Mobley's at like nine and a half rebounds. He gets moved to 11 and a half rebounds because he's a center playing around the rim more and Allen's not going to steal. Right. You know, so he's going to get the usage, but his three should go down. So so the juice should go up if you ask. So it should be like minus 400 is really what it should. That That should be the real price. Minus 400-ish, 450. So 220, it was 140 a couple games ago. So I still think we have a little bit of window there for value. I hate it when you make sense. Yeah, I hate it when you make sense, but apparently you do make sense. We're going with the under. Free anxiety, we're given props. And anxiety. Doug, I want to get into some NBA future talk here. I have seen some teams move around, teams I did not expect it to move around, but... There looks like there's value here, and that means you are going to talk nerdy to me, my friend. Let's get into it. Uh, Denver has had some struggles. 0-2 against the series. They have tumbled down a little bit. We're used to seeing them up top there with the Celtics. They have dropped all the way down to 15-1 to now. Celtics are now the odds-on favorite, sitting at minus 120. Is there something here? 
So much like the Super Bowl, and we always talk about this, do you bet the quarterback to win MVP or do you just bet the team on the money line? Well, we have that option in this market with the finals MVP. And I actually think there's a ton of value with several teams or players, I should say. And Boston makes everything interesting because, as you mentioned, they're an odds-on favorite and they're so balanced, right? They have a few guys that really could win. So let's talk about, uh, first things first, the big names outside of Tatum being the favorite. That's understandable. But this doesn't make sense to me. You have Anthony Edwards plus 380 and Minnesota to win it all is plus 320. I think they should be the same. I really do, or maybe 10 cents apart. I think the 60 cent difference is worth it to quote unquote get cute. If you like Minnesota, just bet Ant to win finals MVP. Now they have some dudes like Carl Anthony Towns, but four out of seven games, Edwards will be there. He, and he's going to be the guy. So maybe Towns might outscore him in two of those games. Doesn't mean he's going to win finals MVP. Also, Edwards brings it on D. We've seen defensive players in the past, like Andre Iguodala win finals MVP. Edwards does enough on defense. Rudy Gobert is not winning finals MVP. Uh, this one's the most surprising. SGA, 7-1. to one. OKC is 6-1. to one. This should be like 6-1 to one plus 630. Like, that's, I mean, he's, he just finished runner-up in the MVP. He does everything for that team. He's the orchestra, but he's got the ball in his hand. Again, think four out of seven games. This one's even more surprising. Jalen Brunson, 12-1, to one, where the Knicks are 10-1. to one. That should be 50 cent difference. Right. Okay. So if you like any of those three teams, it is make more sense to just bet those three superstars to win finals MVP. Now, keep in mind, many, many years ago in 07, I'm still bitter. I had Tim Duncan to win finals MVP and Tony Parker won it. It's unforgivable. But those things happen. But the line value you get with these guys, and I think things are more evolved now and we won't have any silly voting like we did that, that year. So, what brings this brings us ultimately to Boston. Jason Tatum is their best player, but it's sort of he's like a not one A one B, but like one B to two A with Jalen Brown. I think the value is, and I've already posted this at a little bit bigger of a number, and I still think this is an okay number. Derek White at twenty plus twenty five hundred. He bombs threes in game one. He had twenty five points, seven of twelve shooting. Now, typically, when he goes off. One of the uh, the Brown or, or Tatum go mm-hmm. go off as well. So for twenty five to one to hit, he would need to play well in all four wins, and then Brown and Tatum to alternate playing well in two of the four. But don't forget, Porzingis is going to come along. Maybe he can dilute the Brown and Tatum situation. It's unlikely to land. Don't get me wrong, but twenty five to one translates to three point eight percent. So you, I'm saying a team that is above fifty percent to win the title because they're minus money. So their probability to win the title and they have the home court and all that good stuff is above 50%. You're telling me a guy who just dropped 25 and and had seven made threes who's been key for them all year, not the best player, he can win MVP. There is a path that's better. He should be like 14-1 to 1 in my world. So I, if I were an odds maker, I would narrow the gap with Brunson and SGA and all those guys and then reduce Derek White. The problem is for an odds maker is Jalen Brown has odds, Tatum has odds, so all these guys, sort of only one of the Celtics can win it, right? But I think there is a little bit of value. Like Brown, like I said, should be like, or excuse me, uh, Derek White should be like 14, 14 to 1. I like it. Talking and nerdy to, uh, see, that was too nerdy. You know, it, it got 3.8%. We got a little nerdy there. We got a little nerdy there. If it was, hey, head on over to the website, onlyplayers.com. Head on over to our app, Only Players app. It's all broken down there for you. How we bet, why we bet, we hope you win. And uh, any segment with a Timmy D shout out is is a great segment. There you go, folks. Welcome to Just Arthur's Court. That's right, not King Arthur. Why the king doesn't have his crown on? King, why don't you have your crown on? What happened, Doug? He lost his last pick. It's okay. It's okay. Why? Because this is the king of underdogs. My man loves a challenge and goes for an underdog every single time he's up here. Uh, however, we're looking for a streak. The personal best is five in a row. Five, and what was that? Four were outright on that one? Uh, Yeah, four of four the five outright. Four, four out five outright, but we got to get going again, Doug. We got to get going again, so uh, let's go. Well, now this involves baseball, which obviously is outright win, so he's going to hit the diamond. He's had some success here on the diamond early in the season, so he's going to grab uh, the Seattle Mariners 
as plus 110. So he's a small dog, so he's going to take a small dog on the diamond. Uh, Gilbert's on the bump, and this guy's been lights out. 1.69 ERA, a whip under one, 0.79. Eight shutout innings in his last outing. In fact, as Arthur brought to my attention, five straight outings, two earned or less. So this guy can pitch. And the question is, you know, the Twins are good. They had that, like, ridiculous win streak, but they've you know, Seattle won game one of this series. The Seattle offense is limited. They rank among the worst in baseball in the, in the key categories. But, you know, get a crooked number up, and and maybe they can get the win, a, a, a pitcher's duel here. So Arthur's going to roll with the Seattle Mariners early, early first pitch on a Thursday out here in the West Coast, so 10 o'clock for uh, the little man here. Fair but enough. He wants to get back in the swing of things and get back in the win call. To a quick little uh, King Arthur, good luck rub right there for good luck. Bango, there it is. That is just Arthur's court.